Okay, I think um, we can. I think we can start now. I mean, okay. it's it's nine o'clock. At well, for for me, it's nine o'clock, <laughs> not for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit um, later in Europe. Yeah. I, um, thank you very much, uh, Bettina, for um, uh, visiting us in this um, IoT course. Uh, I'm I'm super happy that you have uh, well agreed to to give a <laughs> guest lecture here. It, it's a pleasure, Frederick, and thanks for inviting me. And um, you know, we're watching this program with great interest. Um, hopefully, the students will. Um, managed to get their projects up and running and, and um, do so well. Um, I'm here today, of course, to talk a little bit more about PyCom and the typical sort of developer journey uh, that we've seen, as well as a few recommendations at the end um, on what to look out for when you're doing IoT projects. Uh, I'm very so, intrigued and I'll be keeping, well, I'll, I'll be letting you know if there are any questions. I'll okay. be watch, watching the the feed all the time. We have a Slack channel open and also the YouTube live. Brilliant. And we have uh, well 44 people watching live Excellent. now. So you well, get the sense everyone. of the audience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great. So welcome everyone and thanks yeah. for dialing in. Um, I hope I'm going to be loud and clear today. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about PyCom, um, the typical journeys we see with developers and, and um, a few recommendations at the end, some observations I've done through my career in, in tech. Um, PyCom, <clears throat> as you would have probably read by now, um, we're in the process of building one of the world's most integrated IoT platforms. And the whole reason we're doing that is with a laser focus on developers and um, the technologies and solutions required to get products to market quickly. So today, as I said, I'll talk to you about PyCom, uh, what made us set up the company and a little bit about the journey and the portfolio. Um, then I'll talk to you about the, the development journey we're seeing with um, our customers. And then I'll give you some of my recommendations as to you know, how to get a successful IoT project off the ground. So who are we? Well, um, I'm one of the co-founders um, of PyCom. I, uh, set the company up with Fred DeHaro, our CEO in 2015. We had a few other founders then who've since uh, left the company, but um, we set the company up because we were um, convinced that we could do a much better job for developers um, in getting technology to market. Um, we, we've since grown the company from a startup to now a scale up. We've taken some seed investment um, and we've grown the company now to, uh, 25 people, 80% of whom are developers. So we we know developers very well. We've got uh, teams in the UK, teams in Eindhoven, and a team in uh, Bucharest in Romania. Um, and our teams are focused basically on, on bringing our portfolio to market. And that portfolio I'll talk to you a little bit about um, later on in the deck. Um, it's full stack. It comprises everything you need for um, uh, getting your IoT project to market. We've got some patents pending and more coming. So we're, we're, we're busy. So who do we serve? Well, you know, we, we um, when we set PyCom up, um, we could see that projects took ages to get to market. And so, as I said earlier on, we have a laser focus on serving developers and, and you guys are part of that group, uh, inventors in uh, universities, in other education establishments, but also in small and medium-sized businesses and all the way through to very large corporates. We know you all have the same needs. You need, you have pains in getting um, technology to market and, and some of those pains are um, well recognized within PyCom and, and we're trying to remove them, remove the barriers to, to getting a successful IoT to market. So how do we do that? Well, we, we know that the journey is typical. This is a simplified uh, look at a journey, um, IoT idea. So uh, before I started PyCom, um, we could see that projects would take between 24 and 36 months to get to market. And of course, that is far too long for most projects to still have inertia, energy, and also cash. So, um, we set out to, to reduce that cycle to 
something like three or four months. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we have had a few examples of getting um, from the idea to products rolling off the manufacturing line, but in most cases, it takes still a little bit longer. So how are we doing it? Well, we have a, a full uh, stack. Um, we started with the hard bit. So we started with some of the hardware that you're seeing today on your desks or in your labs. Um, so development boards, shields to put them on, right the way through to OEM modules that you can use to go to scale with. Um, we are currently building a new range of sensors that you can attach to uh, some of the shields. And that was partly based on a conversation with Frederick actually saying, we wanna give our students a little bit more granularity um, around connecting sensors. And we've had customers also who said, well, at proof of concept, I'd like to pick and mix from a suite of sensors rather than the ones you decided on in some of your shields. Um, we've added um, a full, a cloud-based environment that also has an app that allows you to uh, manage your device right from the way you receive it to getting it thrown into something that um, is a cloud platform. And our IDE, which is the programming environment, PyMaker, um, you can either run as a plugin to Atom or Visual Studio Code, or you can run it now also uh, straight from the cloud in PyBytes. Um, We've added networks, so we're, you're familiar with uh, LoRa and Sigfox and cellular in, in LP1, and of course also Wi-Fi and, and uh, Bluetooth. Um, by adding a LoRa server to our uh, PyBytes cloud, um, we've also added mesh networks, and we're now adding cellular airtime. Um, you can grab your data from our cloud. Uh, you don't have to, by the way, we don't lock people into the cloud, uh, but we do have APIs for you to grab it into other platforms if, if that helps. And of course we deliver services. So a lot of customers come to us and say, look, I can do half of the job, but I can't do everything. Can you help me with uh, some additional services? Um, one of the things that's, that's really key and, and what wasn't in existence before we set PyCom up was this suite of hardware that you've seen uh, in front of you also, which is a same footprint. So you can swap and mix and match the development boards depending on what networks you want. Multi-network at the time where we set PyCom up, everybody told us, why are you building cost into a product by putting multiple radio chips in there? But actually, it turns out now that the industry is actually going that way and that everybody's putting more than one network into um, IoT products to create that redundancy. And of course it's MicroPython programmable, so it's much easier and quicker to get to uh, write your application and get a product uh, up and running than if you were writing it in C. And it's also easier to manage um, the uh, updates to the program uh, later on. So full stack, um, and it's a, uh, what should I say, a vanilla flavored stack that can be used across any dash, any um, vertical market. So, um, you know, I've put some markets in here, industrial, agriculture, utilities, uh, building management or facilities management, smart cities. And um, on the next slide, I'll show you a little bit about uh, the development journey. But before I do that, uh, Frederick, I don't know if there's any questions about PyCom and, and where we are today. If not, I'll just keep going. Yeah, I haven't gotten any questions uh, okay. so Brilliant. far. They, they, uh, they are probably very engaged in, in, uh, in your presentation. <laughs> but we have 61 uh, live, 62 actually now. It's, it's okay. uh, oh, you're going in the right direction. So Brilliant. <laughs> keep Brilliant. on. All right, I'll keep going. So typical development journeys that we're seeing. Um, so it all starts with the customer, of course. And, and when you're, I know your students and you may be doing this for proof of concept or to learn how to set products up, but the typical journey for many of our customers, um, they come to us because they have an area of expertise in a vertical market. So they, let's say it's someone who's used to driving technology into agriculture. And um, they'll say, okay, I can create a dashboard for a livestock monitoring, so monitoring cows in the field, where they are, how they're feeling, um, temperature maybe, and other uh, biometric data from a cow. And setting up a dashboard um, to deliver that data to a farmer or a customer is less complex 
Um, so, so what happens is often our customers will come to us and say, I've got this idea, I can deliver a service to my customers uh, by giving them this dashboard that needs data from the cows. So what they do is they go straight to the bottom of the stack and you see the stack there on the, um, on the, the left-hand side. They go and think about what hardware do I need to put into this solution? Uh, as in, what do I need to attach to the cow to collect the data? And then they start thinking about firmware writing, managing their networks, what networks need to be available. So of course, location of um, the deployment is important. Is it a city? Is it a, an agricultural field? Um, you need to be able to manage the devices that are attached to the cows remotely. So you don't have to go and find maybe a thousand cows in the middle of Australia. Um, and then you have, a, a, you have to have a platform um, that, collects and sorts the data that delivers it then to the dashboard. And that's kind of a basic outline of a stack, an, an IoT stack that a customer needs to consider. So what have been uh, the, the pains that developers have gone through and, and the reason for which we set PyCom up and the things we're trying to remove? Well, if you're a small and medium-sized customer, which many of our customers are, um, the access to components and part and support from larger um, manufacturers is just not there. It's difficult. If you come to a, a large manufacturer of components and tell them, look, I just need 10 chips to get my proof of concept done. And by the way, whilst you're supplying those, could you, could you help me also understand a little bit of the, the technical ins and outs of your chips? You will get no support. It's just too difficult for very large organizations to manage. Um, Network redundancy was missing. So as I said earlier, not many solutions, if any, had multiple LP1 networks available uh, right from the proof of concept stage. Um, and that meant that, you know, in, in you know, four years ago when we started PyCom, um, people would have cellular technology. They might have had Wi-Fi or Bluetooth on their products, but there certainly wasn't much LoRa or Sigfox or other uh, types of network available. And of course, we now have the emergence of satellites. So it'll be interesting to see how that uh, fits into IoT. And, and um, in my mind, it's a question of how quickly they can and make the chipset smaller and the radio uh, area smaller. Um, proof of concept solutions that weren't fit for scale. So um, a lot of customers would start with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and they're brilliant platforms for getting up and running quickly. They're well known for many developers. And at the time, they just weren't uh, ready for edge of network deployments. They've since changed. So maybe I should update my deck a little bit. Um, uh, because I know Arduino has launched a new platform and, and Raspberry Pi, of course, are moving uh, as well. So, but at the time, you know, we would have uh, proof of concept solutions that uh, were done on those platforms. And then by the time customers had tested for six months or even 12 months uh, with those, they had to return to the drawing board to do the real thing. And that, of course, uh, made the program six to 12 months longer than it, it had to be. Um, some platforms, um, some hardware vendors lock the technology into their platforms. I'm not going to name any names, but of course, it can make the solution very expensive when you scale if you have to pay three or four or five euros a month per device to be able to access a cloud platform. And of course, all of this contributes to long and expensive times to market and, and projects that run out of um, energy and resources and cash. And I'm put cash here in big, bold letters, because cash is absolutely king in, in all of this. Um, regardless of whether you're in a very large organization or in an SME or as a startup entrepreneur yourself, um, you must consider cash as part of the uh, equation. So the journey to market in more detail. So the, the journeys that we see uh, today uh, that they'll start with a proof of concept that looks very much like what you have in front of you, um, a development board, a shield, some way of connecting it to power, some antennas, maybe a case. Um, and that, that can get uh, up and running in hours, really. You don't really have to spend long now on, on doing, uh, doing that. Then you spend a few weeks, maybe a few months in discovery with customers. Um, 
creating a proof of concept uh, that customers can evaluate. And if we talk about a cow again, let's say, uh, you can attach a neck strap to, to your proof of concept, attach it around the, the neck of the cow, and maybe you use 10 cows to start with uh, to let your customers evaluate whether the solution is is, is uh, robust enough. And, and with that, of course, you would have developed a MicroPython application that says, well, tell me the temperature of the cow once a day, tell me where it is, and um, if it's lying down for too long, I need an alert, something like that. Once you've done, um, I would say, an alpha or a beta test with a customer, you will go to a solution specification that takes into account the feedback you had from the testing you've done in the field. And then you would move to something that looks like a first prototype. And that's typically five to 10 units. Sometimes it's 50 if there's good confidence in um, the, the proof of concept that you've used. Um, and for that, you would use a smaller manufacturer to give you um, the printed circuit board. You might use an OEM module. You can also do proof of concept again or prototypes with, we have customers who use our development boards um, <laughs> for a real deployment, um, but more often than not, they will go to the W1, G01, L01, and L4 or go and design their own thing. You know, we don't force people to, to come back and use our OEM modules. But the benefit of doing it is, of course, they don't have to rewrite their applications in any way. They can basically port what they have uh, with their development board and the shield onto um, a custom made PCB and an OEM module. Then you get your prototypes, you will review and validate that with your customers again, probably. And then you go to something that looks like um, the real product with mass production. And normally that's around two to 5,000 units for many customers. Um, and after that, you can then go to scale. Once you've deployed, um, everything is tested, you've been through maybe a few additional design iterations, uh, then you move to scale and you would typically find a manufacturer that can manufacture at scale with economies of scale that comes with that. So here's a, an example. Uh, it's a simplified version of a, a product. So they started with uh, desktop development then they created a proof of concept. Uh, they did the integration with the OEM module. They designed their own product and then it went in. And this one was for a factory that has uh, monitoring equipment around um, Tesla car manufacturing. So they did their own uh, app, as you can see at the top. They um, they then uh, got us to help them uh, design and integrate a product uh, for them to, to manage. So I'm going ahead pretty quickly here. So um, I don't know if there's any questions around the developer journey and, and the um, thoughts we had on that. I haven't got um, any questions okay. about that. So, but uh, we just, really? just uh, um, one, one thing that <laughs> I thought was a bit funny. We yeah. had a guest speaker yesterday, which uh, was about uh, beehives yes. and IoT. And uh, today you're, well, introducing cows. So yeah. we have a theme of this course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Agriculture is a huge market for IoT. There's so many reasons why companies would consider using remote monitoring of livestock or crop uh, so that farmers and, and staff in farms don't have to physically displace themselves. I mean, we've had uh, customers in the US with cow herds where, you know, cows are known for being in, in their herd, but all of a sudden you've got 10 cows veering off to the right and a cow can be a thousand dollars and of course if you've got 10 of them veering off to the right going into the sunset um, you don't really have this can be hundreds or thousands of acres of land where unless you attach something that locates them you don't know where they are and you don't know whether they're well and so um and, and at the same time, if you know where they are, you know they're well and they're safe, um, you don't have to send anyone out. No one needs to ride out to find them. You can just do it at your convenience. Whereas um, if you have no, nothing attached to them, you're spending you know, resources and time and, and money um, finding them and, and bringing them back to the herd. Um, likewise with crop, uh, crop monitoring systems, um, We've had many customers looking at um, 
you know, water and ir irrigation systems, um, uh, acidity and other sort of um, live live uh, data for for crops because sometimes it can be uh, a question of a big question of the percentage of yield when you harvest um, if you if you leave it a few more days if you don't leave it a few more days and and the farmer doesn't always have access to driving out and checking everything so there are real financial benefits um, in um, in in attaching sensors in IoT so yeah, I, agriculture is a big market for us. Um, industrial IoT, so automation of machinery, um, ma predictive maintenance for um, big equipment, asset tracking, asset location, um, you know, campus type applications where, for instance, in a hospital, if you are um, attaching sensors to sensors and, and geolocation uh, solutions to, I don't know, crash carts and, and various other things, you always know where they are. You don't have to send staff out on a goose chase to try and find things. So, oh. um, and, and um, we have a number of smart city applications. We have a number of uh, building um, management systems for water, utility, uh, applications like um, uh, energy and room occupancy. Room occupancy has been a, a big thing, and I guess it will be even bigger now with uh, with COVID <laughs> as we progress and, and we need to keep our social distancing. Yeah. Um, so um, on that note, um, the market update um, and the impact of COVID, there's a little bit of discrepancy between the analyst organizations and, and I guess you can find answers for anything you would like to substantiate. ABI Research said that uh, unit shipments this year for IoT devices will be down about 18%, but that's countered by um, IoT analytics were telling us that IoT installations uh, to support everything like remote assets and, and monitoring solutions would become more important. So. It'll be interesting to see um, what happens at the end of the year. I, I firmly believe that most um, analyst predictions uh, for IoT or a lot of analyst predictions for IoT are very optimistic. And that's because we are all in the IoT industry and any industry really, everybody is very optimistic about how quickly we can roll out, how quickly we can get stuff done. And, and therefore, of course, we feed that information into the analyst community who, whilst they take some of it with a pinch of salt, still go by uh, what we tell them as, as industry, um, uh, should I say leaders or people with knowledge. Um, they, there's also reports about supply chain. And, and if you are following the news of COVID impact in technology, you'll, you would have uh, realized that um, component sourcing has become increasingly difficult. Of course, a lot, a lot of factories uh, were closed in China in Q1, and of course, Taiwan and um, other areas of Asia where they manufacture uh, high-tech components have been closed at various stages. And that has had a huge impact on supply chain. Um, so items that were normally 30 to 40 days lead time have turned out to be 96 days. And of course, if you're planning a product, um, that lead time needs to be brought down. So you have options. You can, you can plan and, and buy more quantity um, and, and um, store it somehow. You can spot buy. So you can buy uh, on the spot market, which is typically more expensive, or you can wait um, if, if you have time. And um, one but, question here, uh, Bettina, is yeah? that, uh, well, when you're anyway talking about COVID, I need to, well, yes, how, how have you been affected? I mean, yeah, the supply chain, I mean, obviously has been affected. And, but yeah. uh, how, how has the, well, PICOM and the IoT market and the demand been affected by the COVID situation? We, we've not seen too much effect, to be very fair. I think um, most of our customers and most of our market consists of developers who have just worked from home. So they haven't really stopped their projects unless they've been ill or have had to, you know, take care of, of family members or, you know, children in school or what have you. We haven't really seen a big impact. We've had one or two customers who've come back and said, look, um, 
we're going to be a little bit more cautious on our forecast, but um, most of our customers have actually continued their journey of development and getting to market. So we haven't really seen a big impact. Now, I don't know whether there's going to be a ripple effect because, of course, the majority of the world has been impacted in Q1 and Q2. Um, there is you know, uh, a, a global impact to economy, and that may make uh, people change their decisions. But at the same, same time, you know, IoT is about a zero sum business case. It's about putting technology in place that saves money, ultimately. And so it's, it's, um, I do believe that, um, that putting remote assets in place will help businesses and people ultimately not having to um, to drive out to check something. Yeah, there is a lot of questions coming in here, but I'll, okay. I'll actually um, I'll keep one of them. Uh, one of <laughs> a couple of the questions uh, just a, a bit later on into the yes, discussion, sure. but there came up one uh, question about the COVID situation now. Yeah. But um, are you um, do you have any worries regarding increased uh, trade protections and what's the emergency plans if you can't produce in China anymore? Um, well, I mean, personally, no. I, I think the world will figure this one out. And I know that, of course, between China and, and the US, you might find import uh, duties. And of course, with the UK coming out of Europe uh, and with Brexit, we will need to relook at trade deals. But ultimately, if there's too many restrictions or too heavy a levy on anything that comes in and out of the UK, for instance, um, we we will kill our businesses in the UK. So, so we have to, I think we have to figure it out. And I have faith that this will be figured out. We do have um, offices in the Netherlands and in Bucharest. And of course, the Netherlands uh, is still part of the EU. Um, we, we could still decide to flip um, our HQ to the Netherlands and therefore still be part of the EU. At the moment, there's no need to do that. But it, it is something we've considered um, whether uh, that's worth doing. At the moment, our logistics operations are in the UK. And um, for the simple reason that we and our customers benefit from better shipping terms um, in terms of in and out of both Europe and, and the rest of the world. Uh, we, we ship mainly with DHL and the, the prices that we get here are very favorable. And of course, that benefits our customers and, and, us, and also uh, the local post system here in the UK is yeah. fairly effective. Um, so we, we're not um, we're not that affected by by trade deals. One of the things that is um, uh, key to a key action that we've taken as a result of uh, COVID is um, we have looked at all of our bill of materials and we are in the process of making sure that we have second sources in place. I was going to talk about that a little bit later on, but second sourcing for components is very important. So you know, a recommendation here is to, to build bills of materials for products where there's good supply from multiple vendors. Um, uh, there was a follow-up question about yeah. Russia, if you export to Russia, but that might be a yes or no question. <laughs> yeah, yes, we do yeah. export to Russia, but there is uh, there are some restrictions in shipping in and out of Russia in the sense that um, to ship to a customer in Russia, they have to be a business you're not allowed to ship to an individual or a person. It has to be a business that we ship to. The, the products come back, basically. We've tried it before um, because customers have insisted and, and the products basically are shipped back to us. So um, as long as it's a business, we can ship to Russia, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I have a, like a bunch of questions. Uh, yes. But I'll just let you continue on, yeah. on, on your presentation yeah. a little bit more. And I'll bunch them up and we'll have sure. like, because I don't want to interfere too much with your presentation. No, that, so. that's absolutely yeah. fine. That's absolutely fine. So um, one of the other things around supply chains and impact is, of course, um, uh, and maybe that shouldn't sit on the supply chain as much, but more under the COVID impact is that um, a lot of customers are conserving their cash and they're looking at operational expenditure instead of capital expenditure. And that means that if you're, if you're developing uh, IoT, and we see a lot of business models like this, where 
um, you've developed an IoT solution with a full stack, um, maybe a, um, hardware as a service or a rental model or a recurring revenue model around the solution is, is maybe a attractive to the customers that you're dealing with. So it's definitely something to be um, to be considering. We've seen a lot of uh, uses for, for drones. Um, we have a number of drone companies, one in agriculture, funnily enough, um, a very early customer uh, flying out using LoRaWAN to connect to uh, sensors that were attached to uh, livestock. Um, but we're also seeing defense applications now with drones and many, many other areas. Um, and of course, uh, retrofit solutions. So smart meters, um, anything where you have an installation that's already in place, typically around utilities or machinery or uh, a campus type where it's easy to install uh, an IoT or a connectivity retrofit solution. Um, it is, um, is interesting as, as an outcome of uh, the COVID-19 impact. So uh, just a little bit about the size of the market. You know, we've seen for many years now, 50 billion connected devices by 2020, then that was taken down to something like 30. And, you know, the, the saga goes on. How big is the market? How many connections? How many um, products are going to be out there? And one of the things you'll also find is if you're talking to VCs or raising cash, um, everybody likes the area to the left, uh, to the right, sorry, the applications area, which is the cloud area where you typically find recurring revenue, software as a service models um, that underpin a really solid business case. They're less keen as you move towards uh, the left side of the slide towards hardware. Um, but you cannot establish IoT applications. You cannot provide IoT solutions without hardware. It is a necessary part of delivering a full IoT ecosystem. And that's part of the reason. It's difficult, it's expensive, it's a kind of lumpy as business and, and it's management of physical products. It's certainly not easy. We've, we've felt this, <laughs> we've done it. Um, uh, but it's necessary and it's actually going to account for 26, maybe even 30% of the revenue opportunity in IoT. So even though it might make the journey to successful uh, provision of a, an IoT solution more difficult, we definitely feel that it's worth uh, continuing our journey in hardware, but adding the rest of the stack. And here you could say the stack is lying down in a way because it's hardware and, and the networking and, and then the cloud um, and, and application where on the right hand side. So the IoT ecosystem, well, I mean, we, we all claim to have an IoT platform. There's about 620 IoT platforms in the world and counting and, and um, it's difficult to decipher what's a platform, what's a single solution, you know, how does it how does it all stack together? There are alliances and partnerships happening. Um, you know, some of the very popular uh, IoT platforms um, that I would call a cloud platform is AWS, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, and Google, and we work with all of them. But there's also SAP HANA, IBM, Bosch have got their own platform. Um, you know, that 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 they are endless and um, some of them are skewed towards a particular purpose. Um, I've spoken to a number of VCs um, in the last few years. And of course the new frontier of investment is a full vertical stack. So talk about agriculture, a, a solution to monitor cows or a solution to monitor machinery in a factory, insurance telematics, um, but something that gives you the full stack, all the elements, a customer can go and take the whole solution and they are up and running. That um, gets investment uh, from VCs. And, and if you go and look at some of the deep tech investors in, in, um, in the VC world, they do invest in, in full vertical stacks. Um, so that's worth considering if you are building a product, try and see if you can go that step further and, and develop the whole stack. You'll definitely be able to attract um, uh, good funding with that. 
So I've got some recommendations. Before I go to those, I don't know, Frederick, if there's any other questions I need to sort of scoot in over. Uh, yeah, there, <laughs> you, there, there are too many. <laughs> OK. <laughs> okay. Should we have, perhaps we should just, just try to well, get rid of the questions right away, yeah, sure. and then we'll continue on. And, yeah. and let's see yeah, if yeah. you might, some of these questions, you might just say that, OK, I'm going to talk about in OK, in just yeah, a sure. And, yeah, that, yeah. and that might be a good way to do it. Yeah. So, Let's let's start from uh, the chronological order here. Yeah. Um, um, and one interesting question about uh, uh, computational entropy, and um, so is well, is generating computational computational entropy an issue for IoT devices? Um, Co computational entropy. I'm yes. not sure I even understand the term. I do no. apologize. Well, <laughs> I have a very old engineering degree from about well, 20 years ago. So um, I, I think we're talking about entropy in the informatics perspective here. But uh, let, let's say that we'll just skip that question just for uh, a <laughs> Yes, bit. if you can and, give uh, me an opportunity um, to answer that. I, I'm happy to, <laughs> to look into it, but it's not certainly not something I've come across as an issue. Yeah. And there is one question about security from Sophia. Yeah. And, uh -huh. um, and she, she asked, what's up your opinion about security and how secure are your products yeah. from, like, from hacking? So That's a really good question. So security for us, of course, there is security. Uh, there's enterprise level security in our products. You can encrypt uh, the data and, and what have you. What you can't do is secure your device against someone with a screwdriver who goes out and tampers with it. Um, and of course, hacking happens on IoT devices as well. The way to secure IoT is to do it across the full stack, because if you only secure the device or you only secure the network or you only secure the cloud or you only secure the dashboard, then you have these weak points in between uh, the elements of the stack. So. To, to create good, robust security solutions, of course, you need to look across the whole solution. Um, you need to assess the risk. So if I am providing um, IoT for a hospital, so connected devices that have some element of critical care in there, of course, security is super critical and, and uptime and you know the SLAs, so the service level agreements you'd put in place are much, much more stringent than if I am, um, let's say, monitoring whether the lights are switched on or not in a Coke, Coca-Cola vending machine. Um, and, and of course, in that context, um, is the Coca-Cola vending machine connected by Ethernet to the rest of the office uh, WLAN? If that's the case, then yes, the machine needs to be isolated. And so, so I, what I'm trying to say here is it's it's about considering the individual use cases and making sure that the security solutions are wrapped around the whole stack not just the elements yeah 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 and uh, it's <laughs> yeah i mean you could probably speak for hours on on, on that topic <laughs> I assume, but... Uh, well, let's, let's skip to the next question. And um, yeah. uh, there is a newly launched ESP Rainmaker IoT platform. And yeah. I've got a question about that. Yeah. Uh, what's your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, Espressive uh, are actually, Espressive are an investor in PyCom and they've been a very early partner of ours um, and have done incredibly well. Um, Theo Suian, uh, who is the CEO of Espressive, is... Um, a god in IoT at the moment and, and is extremely um, uh, competent in terms of predicting what the market needs. And the ESP32 was our chipset of choice uh, from the beginning um, and will definitely continue uh, working with Espressive. Espressive are also building an ecosystem around their products. Um, I haven't tried the Rainmaker. It was launched a few uh maybe a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, um, maybe a bit longer. I, I became aware of it a few months ago, I think. Um, and so by all means, try it out. Um, it, it's, uh, it's probably very good. Uh, everything that comes out of Espressive, it seems to be uh, working really well. And, and uh, you know, we wish them every success with the Rainmaker. Yeah, and, no, and um, yeah. I haven't tried it either. So, but it, no. it looks it looks nice, and uh, yeah. obviously I need to try it out as well. Yeah. Um, 
uh, yeah, we have more questions here that um, um, if, if a, a client wants to manufacture their own product yeah. uh, after they have done their proof of concept, yeah. um, are, are you involved in that process or is it, I think you mentioned this before. Or... Yeah, that's completely up to the client or the yeah. customer. So um, we can be as involved or as hands off as, as they want. They don't even need to tell us what they're doing. We, we have um, so many customers, we don't see them until they come and say, well, I now want um, 5,000 LO1 chipsets or um can i can i buy what's the price for volume of products um absolutely and we support their introduction to to the factory and it, it, anything they need really we we don't uh we don't um uh force ourselves on any customer we're very low touch and we prefer to be low touch uh, where we have stepped in to help is um just in the initial stages of um, integrating uh, the OEM modules, um, there are some things to observe. It's all written in our documentation. So by all means, if a customer has the skills and competencies and the partnerships in manufacturing, absolutely go for it. And then um, there is also some follow-up questions on the same topic, but okay. if, if, if are the PICOM devices itself, like if you have a low Pi device, yeah. can you just buy more of them, scale them up and use them for an industry grade application? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, they're all CE, FCC, um, IC and RCM certified. So um, they are, you can use them for industrial grade applications. And, and as I said, we have got customers rolling out uh solutions uh, tank monitoring solutions and various others with the development boards you can do that of course um there are economies of scale to be achieved um when you move to the oem range it's about half price of of a development module but it does require the development of a pcb that supports it and um you know depending on the sensors someone wants there so it's, but we don't you know yes absolutely you can use it we have ip67 cases for um dust and ingress and, and water protection uh, that can be used or customers can create their own cases for whatever they're doing sometimes it makes sense to start um if you're starting out and you're new to iot or you're setting up a new business or you don't quite yet know um, how customers are going to um, use the products. It does make sense to run some pilots or some early stage um, products that just build on the development boards and then plan to migrate to one of the OEM range products later on. Um, but yes, and yeah. we do have volume, we have volume discounts, of course, on the development boards as well. So if, yeah. if you are going to volume, call us or drop us an email and we can, we can help. Yeah, and uh, well, and that, and I came up with a big question here: <laughs> the story of PyCom. Yes. <laughs> how was it founded? <laughs> Perhaps you can keep it short, but like, yeah, definitely. What, what, how? What's like the the idea behind it, and what was the biggest challenge when yeah. when you? Oh. Yeah. So we. Um, in 2015, we'd been, both Fred and I had worked for an MVNO, which is a mobile virtual network operator for a few years. And we could see all the problems that happened at hardware level. So when customers were trying to go from, we had some vending machine examples where customers were trying to get them connected. These vending machines were placed in petrol stations where um, the customer who owned the vending machine didn't own access to the Wi-Fi network. And so connecting a vending machine via Wi-Fi um, or even um, other networks that were local was impossible. Um, it, it just meant that they could never get in touch with the device. So they, they decided to implement a cellular solution um, and um, that worked really well, but it took ages because they had to start from scratch. And, you know, a project that we could deliver now within three to six months took something like 24 or 36 months. We also had some robotic lawnmowers where the manufacturer was hoping to get the product to market within six to 12 months. And it took 36 months to get the product to market because the hardware piece was so complex. So and at the time as well, um, we had the emergence of LoRa. And Laura Wan and of course Sigfox became more rolled out as a network, and we had the idea that um, we we could do with more networks than just cellular. Um, so we presented it to 
you know the people around us and and um it was decided that wasn't a good idea so we thought well we think it's a good idea so we're going to go and help developers make this happen we always knew we wanted to create a platform and then we gradually we started with um the wi-fi which was just a wi-fi and bluetooth product uh, leveraging the esp32 we then built the lopi which was the first lopi uh, that just had laura wi-fi bluetooth uh, then came the FiPi and the GPi, and you know we built accessories around the portfolio gradually. We always knew we wanted to build a full stack. Um, it, it, consider it the Apple of IoT. You know my slide deck, the strategy in was it September twenty? Oh, I can't remember when it was, but my slide deck um, very much brought out a, a philosophy around making IoT as easy as when you pick up an Apple iPhone and you have to configure it for the first time, you're taken through a wizard and within five minutes, you're up and running on the network, you're logged into your various apps, you can load more apps to it um, and, and you're up and running basically. We want to make IoT as easy as that. And we've got lots of stuff in the pipeline and in the portfolio that we're gonna you know, deliver on. And, and part of it is the sensor range that's coming out. We're working on machine learning libraries um, that eventually will translate into AI. And um, we have um, ideas around how to create the, the app store for IoT, similar to Apple, where um, instead of having to write your own apps, um, you can either write apps for the greater good of the community. And of course, we're not asking people to do this for free, or you can grab apps that others have developed. So similar to the app store, same principle. But yeah, I mean, we so we set up in, in 2016, uh, we really started in earnest and um, it's been a, 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 a long and very busy journey. Uh, we started three of us and, and we are now 24 people. Uh, we've bootstrapped the business by and large. We have had some investments from angels and a few partners. Um, it, it's been a roller coaster, a great, um, a great experience. Uh, we've met so many people. Last year, you know, Frederick was part of some of the events we hosted around the world, every every continent in the world, um, and uh, we've got so much more to do. So our yeah. journey doesn't finish here. But yeah, I could go on forever. So yeah. apologies. <laughs> yeah. Um, but well, it, well it, and also, I mean, your, your story is also part of the reason why we use your product in this course. Uh, we, we don't really want to, well, as a university, we want sure. to be open to use yeah, whatever product. But um, I mean, we, we needed to start something that, that yes. was like pretty easy to get students going. And that's, yeah. that's the idea behind it. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I think that uh, there are some questions dropping in. If, but if you just continue on your presentation, yeah, sure. I'll just yeah. save these questions until later on. So, okay, brilliant. Yeah. I'll, I'll keep going then. I've got some recommendations for you all. They're not exhaustive, but some of the things yeah. I wanted to highlight when um, when you're thinking about um, your your projects, and and then, and in particular, this this concerns the full stack, as well as. Um, you know, when you're doing hardware projects, which I know you're doing at the moment. So know the detailed requirement, um, the expertise that you require. Uh, there's a question around build or outsource, how to choose your vendors and, and cash is king. So size matters, right? So when we're talking about IoT uh, products that sit at the edge of the network, some of the requirements you wanna look at is where does this product need to fit in? Don't create a PCB that is 20 by 20 centimeters if it has to fit in a small enclosure. Um, does it have to sit at the edge of um, um, the network for 10 years on a very small battery? Then you need to consider how much current drain you've got in the product and how to alleviate that by putting putting deep sleep uh, measures in and you know maybe restricting how much data you're sending you know i don't need to know again the cow example if i'm a farmer i don't need to know where the cow is every hour or whether it's well every hour i just need to know once a day maybe where it is and and that it has a pulse and or if, um, if this then that scenarios occur. So if it lies down for more than three hours and it's still, then of course I want an alert to say, go and check on that cow. 
um, sensor types and accuracy is all about, you know, we can all go and pick really nice, expensive sensors for, for, um, for our uh, products. But is that necessary? And sometimes, yes, it is. I mean, if you're doing particle sensing for a city application that monitors pollution, you need to make sure it's the right pollution sensing and that you have the appropriate particle sensing in your, in your monitor. Um, the other thing is, can you scale it? So you may have the best IoT idea in the world, um, and you may be a victim of your own success, that you get hundreds of thousands of customers saying, I want your product. How are you going to scale it without going back to the drawing board or without stopping yourself um, or, or creating barriers for yourself? Dual sourcing is one of those things we talked about, reducing the lead time risks and, and actually last time buy and end of life risk. Uh, whilst you're doing your hardware development. Um, deployment location is all about, is it indoor, outdoor? Does it need to be submerged in water? Um, is it gonna be attached to a dog collar? And therefore, does it end up in a lake when the dog goes swimming? Um, and affordability. Now that is very important because we all have the best intentions on the bill of material cost uh, when we set out and we have a good idea around a product. Just know if you haven't, or if you don't know already, every time you add a penny to your bill of material, you can triple or quadruple that by the time it hits the shelf. Consider whether you're going to sell directly or through a distribution network who also need margin. Think about um, value added tax and import and export duties um, and make sure you really understand what is your customer willing to pay for this product um, by the time you've finished designing it. Um, the expertise you need to build a full hardware product is not just um, you know, laying out a design on a hardware board and adding some chipsets to it. You actually need to know the whole solutions architecture to create an optimal solution. And again, that goes back to understanding the whole stack. What is it? All the questions I asked earlier, um, how does the product interact and fit with the rest of what's going on in that stack? Which networks are appropriate? I mean, I keep going back to agriculture. I do apologize for this, but if you're going into farming and agriculture, there's probably very little reason, maybe not in Sweden, I don't know, but in the rest of the world, um, don't necessarily, you, you should look at whether cellular is an appropriate solution. I mean, LoRa might be a better solution, a mess network around your farm or the campus type you're, you're trying to, to use. You know, if you're in a city, um, it could be that cellular is the best solution. Laura Wan has some, or Laura and Laura Wan has some limitations. And in particular in Europe, you have to observe the 1% uh, duty cycle, which means you can't send or receive more than 1% of the time in the US and elsewhere, it, it's, it's less stringent. Um, in cities, you may want to consider cellular or Sigfox, um, to, and, and you may also consider multi-network. Um, so, you know, sometimes the application runs on one network, other times it runs on another. And, and of course, firmware writing. So you need to have at least these four skills to put a good solution in place. And then of course, you've got the cloud and the networking and securing the whole stack and all these other services. But as a basis for uh, just pure hardware solutions, um, you need to look at this. And so build versus outsource, I mean, we, we do have customers occasionally coming to us and saying, look, um, I've done a proof of concept with your technology. It's great, but I'm going to build my own product because it's uh, I need ownership of the technology I put in there. I want to put some IP in there. I get more granularity on um, everything I build myself. I perhaps have more flexibility and uh, maybe it's perceived as as lower cost and higher margin for me, and which, which is true in many ways, um, but you do need to consider the, the downsides of that, which is skills and resources to find and hire. And, and one of the things um, we've found is that often customers, um, you know, they, they do that proof of concept. We have a conversation um, about maybe helping them uh, get a, a printed circuit board and a, and a product done. And they, they think they can do it cheaper 
um, themselves because of course we need to pay our staff so we, we add a little bit of margin to things and so they go away and they come back within two to three months um, because they actually find that hiring uh, the skills and working directly with manufacturers is all complex and, and can cost up to three times as much as if they pick an OEM module off our shelves. I'm, I know I'm plugging PyCom at the moment. <laughs> this is the whole reason we set the company up was to make things cheaper, faster, better. Um, but by all means, if a customer is is um, wanting to go and, and do their own thing, absolutely, we support that. It's, it's uh, not a problem. Um, outsourcing lets you focus on what you're good at. So if you want to outsource part of the stack, uh, could be the middleware, could be the dashboard. It could also be the hardware or some of the firmware development or code checking or testing, whatever it might be. It lets you focus on what you're good at. It's quicker to implement. It sometimes extends your network because, of course, you're working with partners uh, in the industry who will talk about you and your solution, particularly if it's brilliant. Um, some of the drawbacks are a lot of partners will want uh, and suppliers will want cash up front. Uh, it is a little bit more expensive. You may erode a little bit of your margin if you take a, a solution into bolt on. And of course, you may be tied into a third party roadmap. So someone else's roadmap um, that you may or may not have influence on uh, helping to drive. Um, Choosing your partners, of course, um, COVID has had the impact we spoke about earlier on IoT um, and the supply chains, and therefore it's important to choose a partner and manufacturing partner that, that has your, um, that, that you communicate well with, that understands your urgencies and your, um, your best practices and all of that. Um, China is a, a very good place to find manufacturing partnerships, but there's also some pitfalls um, and um, you can learn the hard way, uh, <laughs> as in you, you form some partnerships, you, can, you, you order products, and then they come back in, in shoddy quality. But there are also some extremely competent manufacturers. There's also manufacturers elsewhere in the world. Um, we have manufacturers in the UK, we've got them in Europe. Um, so it's just a question of finding who's right for you. Big partners are not always better. Um, big partners means if you're a startup or a smaller team, you may end up getting pushed out because of priorities. If you don't meet your manufacturing slot, for instance, it could mean that you need to wait another one or two months to, to get your stuff done. But um, big partners, of course, have capacity and provided they support you, um, you know, they can be very good partners. Um, one of the things that's helpful with um, choosing your suppliers and your partners is if you can help them contribute to their goals. So one of the examples is one of our high volume manufacturers, um, they wanted to be in IoT and they chose us more than we chose them, to be fair. I mean, the, we wouldn't have had any chance of working with them unless they chose us. And so we've been fortunate that we've been incubated, you know, by a lot of organizations, including Espressive um, and various others of our partners. Um, Goodwill, um, good connections with the leadership teams or the people in charge of particularly the area that you're partnering for is, is important. And don't be afraid to ask for help. We've had to do that. It's, there's no shame in asking for help. The worst case is they say, no, we can't help you. But, you know, engage with them, give them uh, forecasts and your outline and you'll share your vision with them so that they know where you're going with it all. And cash is king. I mean, this is the eternal business mantra, um, your customers, just like ours in many cases, will take twice as long to pay you for stuff. They'll roll out probably half as much as what they forecast, uh, and they'll negotiate at the 11th hour when you when you need their cash to pay your suppliers or your staff or whatever, um, they'll negotiate to, to get better terms for themselves. So make sure you have enough cash to sustain your business or your project whilst you uh, whilst you wait it puts you in a better position and that's it you know we have a, a, a quote here from steve jobs people who are really serious about hard the software should make their own hardware that's us in a nutshell um so yeah that's it from me it's been a pleasure yeah to be able to <laughs> thank you, you all. <laughs> thank you very much and then um well there are um 
uh, one uh, question here, which is very spot uh, spot on. So when yeah. is Highgate going to be released? <laughs> ah, it's shipping this week. Yeah, it's shipping okay. this week. So I'm um, happy to say it's finally, finally coming to market. It's been, of course, COVID had an impact on the Pygate because all of a sudden the regular, you know, the regular lead times that we were expecting were blown completely out of the water. And uh, we had to really work hard. We've incurred a lot of spot by costs to, to get there even for now, but it's rolling out this week. So we're very, very happy with that. I think um, our team in, in the UK have handled something like 134 boxes today of stuff. So um, yeah, it's starting to ship. As of this oh, that, week. that sounds sounds great. Um, yes, I'm, I look forward to getting yes. my hands on one yes. of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one question about the maturity of the Pi Bytes platform in comparison yeah. with uh, AWS or well Google or yeah, yeah. whatever platform. <laughs> you yeah. Showed a yeah, yeah. So so we are nowhere near any of those platforms, and we actually don't compete uh, in many ways. We we are focused on device management primarily. So we, whilst it is a cloud-based platform, you can use it for, for data and network management and, and device management. Our primary focus with PyBytes to, to start with up until very recently has been to um, give people a tool with which they can manage their devices. We're still working on it. Um, we had a PyBytes 2 release uh, in the early part of this year, which amongst others have seen us add the PyMaker ID to the cloud, which which means you you're no longer tied into drivers and um, you know compatibility between your your laptop maybe and and um, the various drivers required. Some people still prefer to load Atom and a PyMaker plugin or Visual Studio Code. That's fine. Um, PyVads is is work in progress. Um, we work with AWS. We work with Google. We work with Microsoft. Uh, we've hosted events. We've, you know, we talk to them regularly. Um, I don't see us competing at all with them. Um, yeah, and that, that's um, uh, I think a good answer to that question. And uh, yeah. one also uh, very interesting question. And you mentioned the machine learning libraries. What's yeah. your timeline? And uh, is there any way to be involved in that? Uh, potentially, it's uh, it started in uh, February. So we've hired a team uh, around one of our very senior firmware developers over in um, Bucharest. So we've got some data scientists and others working on it. And um, the first demo I saw a few months back was a pie track wafted around on a stick to recognize patterns. And of course, machine learning is the future of um, putting intelligence at the edge of the network, right? Because if you can say, okay, the vibration of a machine will tell me how tired it is, how, when to put new oil on it, or when to uh, change a fuse, or, you know, all of that is coming. Now, the sensor nodes that we're launching will be shipping late summer, I think, uh, late summer, maybe early autumn. They're already in progress with our factory. So we've got three of them coming out uh, as the first ones. The, 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 they're called Pynodes. Um, the first versions will have um, cable attachments. The second versions will be Bluetooth nodes, so uh, wireless. Um, and the machine learning libraries will be launched in association with those so that you can start to really create uh, great libraries for that. And we will most likely put it out to our community to help us crowdsource machine learning libraries. I mean, there's no need yeah. for us to develop it all in-house. We would never get to the end of it. Um, if our community wants to participate um, and, and make it, better, stronger, uh, more polished for other developers. We're more than happy to see people get involved in that, definitely. I will be communicating more about that over the summer and, and early autumn. Yeah, I, I look really really look forward to that. And yeah. I, um, well, you, you might be aware of the speech of the TTN conference of Edge Impulse by yes, John. Yes, you know, we know Zach, yeah. And that's, that's a really interesting, um, yes. that's a really interesting um, uh, service actually they are yes. releasing. So uh, have you, um, my first thought, well, okay, could I in, in some way integrate this into MicroPython? Um, and it should be possible, I think, but- Probably, um, yeah. There are no libraries now. Um, no. 
So. I, I don't I don't actually know what their plans are, to be very honest. We know Zach. We spoke to him at the conference and subsequently um, great initiative. They had some funding in the US to, to go and make it happen. And um, so, yeah, I'm sure we will find people implementing that on our products. Um, we're, we're focused on building our own libraries at the moment because it's specific to the census at the moment. But, you know, I'm not ruling anything out at this point. You know, it's about what makes, you know, stuff more useful, solutions yeah. more useful for developers. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, and we have the ten TensorFlow, TinyML. That's yes. also one, one thing if that just could be integrated. I mean, there would be a great potential for. Yeah. For, yeah. For, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, there, one more question here. And uh, how's. Um, How's your view on how you, you how the App Store is going to work? Uh, you talked about the App Store for um, modules. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I imagine it can work. So, so there's several aspects of an App Store because one is uh, creating apps for mobile phones in an if this then that type scenario. And we've got one coming out for the PyGo PyLife range um, that allows you to basically configure the device in a in more of an app way on a phone. Um, but then there's there's also apps in a MicroPython sense where you've written an app that you know detects and monitors something in the field. And instead of someone else reinventing the wheel, um, this app is described, it's put in a library. Um, you decide as the developer of it, whether you want to charge for it or whether you want to throw it out there for free. Uh, create a business model around it and, and it'll work very much like the App Store. That's the vision around it. Of course, um, you can create scoring mechanisms where others are telling uh, the rest of the world this is buggy, it's not buggy, it works really well. Um, and it'll most likely be in association with PyCom hardware. And yet again, you know, once that's up and running, um, I don't see why we wouldn't have even younger students, school children uh, age, using our products, bolting everything together, picking the app, drag and drop type interface where they can um, set up a monitoring of a bird's nest, which I know my children had in the school. Um, they, were, they had a webcam in a bird's nest so they could see what was going on. Well, maybe they can monitor something else that's useful for them. And, and likewise, if you have, um, I don't know, a biology student or um, a, a, a psychology student or something else who, where, where they're not necessarily technologists, um, but they want to start uh, to do some research into, I don't know, tree growth or um, uh, the way people move when they're depressed, whatever it might be, you can imagine that they would use technology to achieve that uh, rather than having to tabulate data and do things manually. And if you can create um, a, a whole portfolio of products, they could literally buy in a store, it arrives, they configure it via an app, uh, they load a MicroPython app that suits their needs. They maybe do some configuration steps. Uh, you know, you've, you've all of a sudden created an environment that's super useful for people who are not necessarily developers, but who need to use technology for various reasons. Yeah. Um, and uh, there is, um, well, I have one question on my own. I need uh -huh. to cover that as well. And that's uh, uh, Adafruit, they, they are, well, successful as well in, in yes. well, in, in uh, well, uh, in, in this area, uh, yes. developing um, well devices for yes. hobbyists and developers. Yeah. And they have their own fork of MicroPython. That's why yes, they do. Call it Circuit Python. Yes. And um, I'm just your thoughts about th that these are not fully compatible with each other. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just you give your thoughts about these. Um. Two. I, I, they decided to do, a, I mean, we, we worked with uh, Adafruit, we sell our products through them, we visited PT and Lady Ada and are good friends with them, if you want, um, and they decided to do their own fork um, for, for various reasons, maybe because it would work better with their own uh, portfolio, um, maybe because, um, uh, I, I don't actually know, but um, I, I, and I don't really have too many comments. I think it's just a, a question of two two different ways. It's a bit like um, 
uh, Amazon Web Service have done, they bought uh, the FreeRTOS platform that we use as an operating system, and they've now created the Amazon RTOS um, uh, for hardware devices. And so these things happen, unfortunately, in the industry. People decide that they can do things uh, optimized maybe for their own environments. Um, I, I guess it it may not help uh, the community as such, uh, particularly around MicroPython, but uh, I don't really know what to comment on it. <laughs> no, and it, well, the thing is that they have a they had a pretty extensive sensor library for yes. for Circuit Python, and uh, there is well some hassle of porting things over. Yes. Uh, so and um, well, um, the, just wanted to hear your thoughts. Yes. And, and, yeah. um, there is one question I think we'll try to wrap it up after this okay. one. But yeah. mm -hmm. well, job opportunities at PyCom. <laughs> always. Yes, always. We're always recruiting. Um, so uh, what have we just done? We've just done a couple of, uh, we've just, just done two recruits in the last two weeks. Um, we are a bit slower than we want to be uh in in terms of getting people interviewed and i still have to go back to some people whom i've interviewed um and so yes by all means send um uh, your cv and a cover letter to jobs at pycom.io uh, we tend to prefer people being at the office so either in the uk or in the netherlands or in romania just because um, i know covid has kind of halted that and we we don't object to people working from home but we feel that the interaction between the team members makes it, it makes everybody more intuitive. So we don't tend to recruit so much remotely. So we, we're looking for people who want to travel, have an experience, have an adventure in Eindhoven or in, in the UK or uh, in Romania, typically. And so the, the, the types of people we're recruiting for are um, technical support um, it's for full stack it's for um, we will be recruiting more cellular developers so networking uh, is important and you know a few others yeah but we're always recruiting and looking out for good talent basically yeah. okay nice to hear and yeah. uh, I think that uh, I've covered like the 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 bulk of the questions now. Okay. Uh, it's been a lot of discussions ongoing. Sure. Um, and uh, they, well, you're, you're, you have more viewers now than when you're <laughs> okay. stopped. So I think that's That's, <laughs> that's reassuring. That's, no one's yeah. fallen asleep uh, yeah. or zoned out. That's fine. Look, if there are any other questions, um, I'm happy to respond to them through you, Frederick, or any of the other team members over in Linear. So um, just feel free to circulate them and, and I'll try and do my best to to answer them in a, a reasonable time frame. Yeah, uh, I could probably just pop in one question about the job. Then, what's what's yeah. the qualifications? Do you need a university degree or? <laughs> typically, um, yeah. typic. I I'm not. We never rule people out. Um, but um, you know, a university degree does give you um, a, a methodical way of resolving problems. But that's not to say you can't learn that on the job. Absolutely not. So we have, we primarily have people who are university graduates, but there are also some who don't have a degree. So I, I, that there isn't really a, um, a, a sort of one answer to that. Uh, it just depends on the qualifications. We do test people and I'm probably going to scare everyone off now because 95% of um, applicants who go through our test don't do very well. It's quite a difficult one, and it's not that um, it's not that we necessarily rule people out if they don't score one hundred percent. It's more about recognizing where are the gaps that we may need to fill in their learning or their uh, skill sets, um, and and we take it from there. But you know, we're not mean uh to 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 applicants and and of course um it, it's about fit cultural fit as much as it's about uh, skill sets and that drive startup life scale up life is not easy it's not for everybody we have had people who've joined us and gone whoa what's the pace here because um that's not at all what i'm used to and so i i wouldn't 
recommend it to people who want an easy life or an easy journey. But at the same time, we do reward people. Um, we've got um, decent salaries, I would say, and a, a good share option scheme and, you know, a fun environment to work in, but it's fast paced. It's, it's not, uh, it's not, um, it's not necessarily the easiest of environment. <laughs> and, and, and I would also say with that, you know, we tend to, we tend to recruit people who have skills already um, because everybody is very, very, occupied with the areas they're working on and so there's less time to to really coach and teach people the right way we, we're not big enough to have very young graduates who need to learn not just um we have got graduates i'm not saying we don't but we we typically work better with people who have a few years experience because it, it gives them not just the you know, the academic experience around whatever subject matter that they're uh, working in, but it also gives them, it, it also means they have um, some level of understanding of what a business is and, and how it, what it means to work in a business. Um, you know, it, it, that's not a dress code kind of um, uh, a question because we, we wear t-shirts and jeans, uh, all of us, but it's more about, you know, how do you set up a meeting? When do you return a call from someone? Um, you know, the sense of urgency around a project. What are your responsibilities and how do you make sure you communicate with the team around you if you're late or if you're early or all of those types of things? Yeah. Okay. But um, <laughs> well, very, very extensive answer for, for that question. I think yeah. that uh, you covered like... <laughs> uh, all of it. Most, uh, <laughs> really interesting to, to hear. Uh, this uh, as an insight from from yeah. you as a startup company as yeah. well so yeah. it's really an added bonus for for this uh, guest lecture i would say well thanks, thanks for having me it's been a pleasure um yeah. as you can hear i i love answering questions i can talk about pycom until i'm blue in the face uh, which yeah. has never happened actually but yeah um happy to answer more questions uh, in the future if people have them and and of course uh, they know where to find you and they're for me yeah I think we'll um, um, keep in touch uh, during Brilliant. the course here, and yes. perhaps we'll be well have some uh, some contact with the developers later on yes. as well. We'll, yes. well, well. I, I am committed to finding yeah. some time where we can put a few of our developers available to answer questions specifically around the projects that uh, people are running. I will make sure we do that. Yeah. Okay. So okay. with those words, I'll um, end the live stream. Um, yes. Okay. So thank, thank you, you very much. Good luck. Yep, thanks.